All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day. As you know, the Leap Media Lab team has been working diligently on a number of different category specific uh, presentations about how different trends have accelerated during the time of coronavirus and how we can expect some of these uh, consumer behaviors and shifts to actually stick around and, and kind of taking a longer term view at the impact of these different categories. And today I'll be discussing uh, how retail has been impacted by the pandemic. I do want to just call out, I have Adam on the line as well as my faithful producer. Uh, he will be fielding questions in the Q&A form uh, in Teams. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them there. I'll be pausing periodically throughout the presentation to address those questions. Um, and uh, we can just go ahead and get started. So before we take a deeper dive into retail itself, uh, I think it's important to just kind of take a moment and discuss some of the macro trends that we've been witnessing here um, with the coronavirus. Uh, overall, what, what one thing that we've been seeing is that um, coronavirus has been acting as a trend accelerator, as I mentioned before. Uh, we're seeing that it has actually been pushing a lot of traditional businesses into the digital age, especially some businesses that have uh, up until this point been a little bit resistant to uh, digital disruption. So, for example, uh, we're seeing some auto manufacturers shift the way that they uh, conduct their business and do online sales, um, offering at-home test drives as well. Um, something that we will definitely be getting into a lot more throughout the course of this conversation today is uh, a large shift towards uh, online grocery delivery and click and collect as well. Um, another area that some people had been a bit hesitant to uh, to adopt before now, uh, now that there's a bit more of a necessity to do so. Um, and also telemedicine, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot more adoption on that side, as well as uh, a relaxation of some HIPAA compliancy that now enables people to use Facebook and FaceTime uh, to get in touch with their doctors without actually having to go to visit a, uh, a doctor's office. Um, and important to point out as we go through here that once consumers get used to accessing services digitally, uh, some of these industries may find that it's hard to go back to their traditional operations as uh, as consumers find comfort and and ease and accessibility through all of these. Another macro trend that we're witnessing here is the rise of the at home economy. Um, it's becoming a lot more mainstream than it has been recently. Uh, we're seeing service based workers that are kind of becoming this new breed of expertise driven influencers. So chefs and teachers and barbers even are going online in increasing numbers to showcase their skills and to promote uh, their related uh, products. There are also a number of online classes for workouts. Uh, there's a huge push in connected fitness right now um, and as well as some people that are stress baking at home as a a form of escape. Um, obviously, the, there's been a huge impact in terms of uh, media disruptions uh, because of the shelter in place guidance from CDC um, and many event cancellations. There have been a number of major disruptions in terms of media productions and scheduling. Uh, if you joined Adam's entertainment discussion a couple hours ago, uh, you will have, you would have heard that our entire windowing strategy of content has completely been thrown up in the air um, is, and is up for negotiation right now. And media companies are quickly moving their content over to digital formats um, as they're struggling to adapt, which is leading to a huge jump in, uh, in streaming. We're actually seeing a 77% year over year increase during prime time. Another major macro impact that we've seen uh, that I think we're still going to be reckoning with um, as we move through this pandemic and as we go through the recovery phase is uh, the economic downturn. Uh, despite the $2 trillion coronavirus stimulus package that the US government passed, it does seem inevitable that we're going to be facing some kind of downturn and potentially a long recovery period. As you can see, the number of unemployed workers in the US has spiked. Um, as as depicted on this uh, now famous New York Times uh, cover story, 
and it will impact the uh, types of products, the amount of products and the categories that people are going to be consuming going forward in the short and long term. Something that's worth pointing out as well is that there is a very acute sense of uh, consumers paying attention to what brands are doing in this time, how they are um, activating corporate responsibility guidelines and, uh, and uh, processes. They are currently pivoting different business models, temporarily shifting supply chains to show goodwill and civic responsibility. Uh, and there is going to be a lasting impact uh, as far as uh, consumers perception of different brands and how they how they've acted at this time. So right now you can see a screenshot from a website called Did They Help, which essentially is a an online resource where you can type in a company or celebrity or any form of entity really and find out uh, based on a simple ranking system uh, whether or not they helped at this time. It's important because uh, nearly two thirds of consumers believe that a brand's response in regards to the crisis will have a big impact on their likelihood of purchasing in the future. So with that said, we're going to dive right into the impact of resale. Um, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 is an unprecedented public health emergency that is rapidly transforming the way we are all living our lives. Uh, it's forcing significant changes in resale and in commerce. Um, and in this time of social uncertainty, what we buy, how we buy, when and where we buy is undergoing a seismic shift. Um, retailers are currently serving their communities on the front line where uh, obviously the health and safety of consumers, employees and partners remains of paramount concern. Uh, retailers are putting responsibility at the heart of their operations and acting right now in order to address the far reaching implications of COVID-19 on their businesses. This is an interesting snapshot from a Bank of America consumer research study that shows uh, category spending across the board. As you can see, a lot of red numbers here, a lot of yellow uh, for most categories. We're seeing a decrease in spend, although there are a handful like uh, grocery and online electronics, which are actually seeing a minor spike as more people are, are um, spending time in their homes and conducting businesses virtually. Uh, you can also see a huge spike on March 12th and 13th in terms of grocery, uh, where there was kind of some panic shopping going on for essential goods. Taking a more specific view at this, uh, you can see some specific products that have been growing versus some that have been declining. Really no surprises here as products that help people perform in-home activities and hobbies uh, are going up as well as pet supplies and, and materials to work from home. Whereas other categories uh, like travel supplies, you can see luggage and suitcases and briefcases right at the top of the list there. Men's swim, swimwear, number four. Um, Things like outdoor activities, party supplies are all declining rapidly. In the short term, uh, there are going to be several product categories that have been aggressively shopped already. Um, as we've kind of gone through this, it, this uh, month of quarantine, uh, people are, are going out and rushing to stock their homes in preparation of, of these shelter and order uh, uh, guidelines from the CDC. And some of these products like toilet paper and cold medicine are unlikely to be consumed quickly and the result will be a delayed decline in sales in those categories as consumers work through their home inventory. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that in this time brand loyalty is being reset um, as grocery shelves are kind of emptying at this at this moment. Um, consumer brand preference erodes. I mean, if you think about, you know, if your options are having your favorite brand of toilet paper or, or not having toilet paper at all, um, it's pretty easy to see how you might be willing to uh, expand the, the types of products that you would be willing to consider at this time. And uh, it is it, so it is forcing consumers beyond their preferred bit brands like never before. Um, and these consumers could emerge from the pandemic with entirely new brand preferences as they discover new products that are suiting their needs um, or potentially an overall lower brand loyalty. 
So I'm just going to dive right in here to the first section. Uh, uh, the first and most obvious impact of the coronavirus has been the erosion in physical retail shopping. Uh, this is a trend that we have been witnessing for a number of years now. In 2019, there was a record amount of uh, U.S. retailers that announced store closings, uh, over 9,300, uh, which was the highest number since the data ha has been tracked since 2012. Even before coronavirus, analysts predicted that 2020 would be a record year for closures, uh, some predicting as high as 15,000 store closures in 2020. Obviously, that number will likely be reset. Um, and thousands of more store closings could be on the way even as we continue to work our way through this pandemic. Um, and the main reason for this is because of those CDC guidelines that have been in place since, since March 16th uh, that are encouraging people to stay indoors, limiting um, gatherings uh, to less than 10 people. Obviously, this is not a situation that is conducive to brick and mortar retail. And so what we've seen is nearly 50% of the retail square footage in the US has actually closed. Um, according to the Wall Street Journal, foot traffic to non-grocery retail stores declined more than 97% during the last two weeks of March. Um, and so this 50% retail square footage number amounts to about 190,000 stores in the US that have closed. However, People are still going to stores to shop. They're just going to shop for different things. I mentioned before uh, grocery. Uh, they're, they're shifting their consumer behavior to staples and necessities. Uh, this comes from concerns about supply as well as concerns about their financial well-being and it's plummeting stock markets and, um, and increased layoffs. Um, foot traffic to grocery stores is actually up 34% nationally um, and as well as uh, foot traffic to warehouse stores, big box stores, drug stores, and convenience stores, whereas visits to uh, brick and mortar clothing stores and shopping malls are down as much as 40%. Now, because we have seen this rush to, uh, to, to go to grocery stores to load up on essential goods, um, that combined with the fact that a lot of grocery stores and convenience stores have shifted their hours to accommodate deep cleaning, dedicated hours for senior or at-risk shoppers. Um, this combination of more shoppers going for essential goods in a more narrow window has caused uh, crowding in some areas, which is obviously um, the antithesis of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here with social distancing. And so in order to help this, ta this, uh, this issue, Open Table has actually come up with an interesting solution. They've partnered with a couple of different grocery stores in California in order to open up um, shopping time. So you can basically go and reserve a slot the same way that you would reserve a table uh, in order to go to a grocery store and reduce overcrowding. So it's only a pilot right now in a couple of stores, but they have mentioned that they are uh, having conversations with uh, grocery stores nationally as well to roll this out. And I think that for those of us that live in or around New York, um, thinking about the long term implications of something like this, you know, it's not hard to think about what a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods looks like um, around rush hour. This might actually be the kind of thing that could be implemented in some other in some high traffic areas in order to uh, reduce foot traffic and increase efficiency of shopping trips going forward, especially as people slowly become more comfortable with being out in crowded spaces. Another big technology that we have seen an increased adoption in is contactless payment. Uh, there was a survey conducted in Israel that found that 87% of shoppers prefer to shop in stores with touchless or robust self-checkout options during the coronavirus epidemic, uh, pandemic rather. And uh, we do, you know, this has obviously been something that's been around for a number of years. Uh, however, because of this forced adoption with people um, more, you know, being a little less uh, comfortable with physical contact, they may actually find that this form of payment is uh, is actually very convenient. And so this is an example of 
of a type of POS technology that we do see increased adoption even coming out of the pandemic. Um, just to give you a sense of how fast things have been changing uh, during the coronavirus virus, um, the United Kingdom actually increased its uh, limit for contact contactless spending uh, in response to the demand for it. Um, and the last increase that they implemented took two years in order to pass various bureaucracy and, and legal hurdles. Um, and this time it took one week out of necessity. So retailers should definitely be thinking about implementing contactless payments going forward uh, in their uh, point of sale technology stacks uh, because consumers are going to discover that ease and convenience. And as we think about what the next logical step of that could be, uh, we can look no further than uh, Amazon Go, which has been opening up different uh, retail locations throughout the US, uh, starting in Seattle. There's some in San Francisco, LA, Chicago, and New York now. Um, obviously, again, as I mentioned before, there is going to be a little bit of a um, an area, a time period of adjustment as people become comfortable being out in public again. And so store concepts like Amazon Go that uh, pretty much eliminate the need for human contact and also are able to um, limit the number of people that enter a store at a particular time could see uh, increased adoption and favorability among consumers. As we talk about this recovery period, it's it's going to take some time and there are three phases really that we can anticipate. The first is the, uh, the ramp up of store reopenings, uh, followed by a period of normalization, both in terms of demand and supply for specific products. Uh, before we finally return to an area of strong growth. However, none of these steps are going to be distributed evenly geographically, and that's both inside and outside of the United States as we flatten the curve in different areas. Um, and we may enter a period where certain businesses and stores technically reopen, yet this demand will have that has shifted online may not necessarily revert back uh, to the levels that it was at before. Um, and looking at China as an example, when 90% of apparel stores reopened in China, the footfall and purchases were still 50 to 60% below the pre-crisis level. So it is going to take a significant amount of time. Um, and we, that means that, we, that the measures that brands are implementing now uh, have the potential to be sticky to consumers going forward. So I'm going to pause for a second there and just see if there are any questions that came in. Yep, we do have one. Uh, the question is, are states or markets that are heavier hit by COVID-19 adopting these digital grocery habits faster than less impacted markets? Yes, that's a great question. And it is absolutely the case, uh, as I mentioned with uh, the open table example, actually, that was in California, so specifically LA and San Francisco. Um, we've obviously seen just stricter um, guidelines in a state by state level as well. Um, certainly for those of us that live in New York, we, we're getting daily briefs. Uh, I live in New Jersey, so we're getting daily briefs as well from the governor in terms of um, you know what is what is an acceptable amount of people to even be in a grocery store at, at a certain time right now uh, in New Jersey at least I know that uh, they're limited to 50 percent capacity and uh, there's a requirement that all employees and consumers uh, wear protective face gear as well um, so in the areas where there is a still that high high demand for essential products uh, with a you know, with, with this uh, kind of gap between demand and the ability to go out and purchase those products, technology has been stepping in to, to close that gap a little bit. Anything else there before we go into e-commerce? Nope, that's it. Cool. Okay, so even before the pandemic, many product categories had already been significantly disrupted by digital over the past 
two decades, really. And most, if not all, resale categories have undergone at least some form of shift to digital. But there are a few categories that are taking a little bit longer than others to come online. And I've mentioned it before, but grocery is definitely one of those um, where there, you know, people want to uh, pick out specific items or they want to uh, actually look at the produce that they're buying. And for those reasons, maybe they, they felt a little bit uncomfortable with other people handling their food. Um, although that, although that particular concern might not be assuaged through um, e-commerce delivery of, of grocery, uh, out of necessity, more and more people are are having to order their groceries online. In fact, um, gr downloads of grocery apps have been up 300% since US exposure. And of those, uh, I think we mentioned before, 26% uh, uh, have been first time adopters. Um, just to give you a sense of how, how large this has grown, the Walmart grocery app downloads have gone up 460% since January, and the Walmart grocery app has actually unseated Amazon as the number one shopping app by a robust 20% as of April 5th. Um, so consumers are adopting e-commerce grocery faster than ever. Um, and again, as we're, as we're seeing, I think that once people get over the hurdle of having someone else pick out their produce, uh, and they understand the convenience of having groceries delivered, there will at least be some demand that stays online uh, even as we go through the recovery period. One interesting data point that I want to point out that uh, we see from Walmart sales data they've picked up on here is, uh, you know, consumer spending has obviously shifted in the short term and Walmart has actually seen a spike in sales of tops uh, so shirts and jackets, uh, whereas bottoms, pants, <laughs> uh, have have not increased at all. So I obviously won't be putting anyone to the test now. Uh, I don't think I could pass that test myself right now, but I just thought that was an interesting uh, way of seeing how that consumer uh, demand has been shifting. What we are seeing, though, is that brands that offer a diverse set of consumer touch points um, have been mostly able to weather the storm to date. Um, and, and by that, I mean uh, brands that do not rely on one source to generate sales, those that have actually turned on, uh, had already previously turned on a uh, robust set of digital uh, tools have been, have been actually succeeding at this moment. So um, Nike, as an example, uh, was, was very early, um, was very early to, adopt uh, different kind of methodology and, and uh, program process for, for how they're servicing their customers when a lot of their stores were hit um, pretty pretty heavily in China. Um, obviously, the, the, most of the, the stores they had there were severely reduced hours, if not totally closed. So what they did was they quick, quickly shifted their inventory to serve the uh, e-commerce demand. And at a time when people were, conf were confined to their homes, they leveraged their digital app ecosystem and their expert trainer network to inspire and support consumers across China to stay active and connected while they were at home. And as a result, the Nike Training Club workouts in China saw an extraordinary rise in sign up and engagement and weekly active users for all Nike activity apps were up 80% by the end of Q3 versus the beginning of the quarter. Um, this strong engagement of Chinese consumers in their activity apps translated into strong engagement with their commerce apps. And as a result, uh, digital business in China grew by more than 30%. Uh, so since this was stress tested in the countries that were first impacted, Nike was able to roll this out globally as their playbook for uh, managing the pandemic. But obviously Nike already had a very robust set of digital tools at their disposal. Um, and so uh, as an example of some other agile brands that are being forced to adapt to may not have already had the digital avenues in place, um, there is a uh, cosmetics brand in China called Lin Quinshuang. Uh, and 300 of their retail stores had to be closed indefinitely. 
And those that remained open were barely receiving any customers, obviously, because people were not comfortable going out in public. Um, and just from the coronavirus alone, initially sales plummeted by 90%. Um, so what Lin Quinn Chuan did is they partnered with Alibaba by sending out coupons to customers while live streaming on Taobao and providing personalized customer support through channels like DingTalk. Um, and so this combination of thought leadership, uh, content while also providing customized service actually led to a, um, a big recovery in their sales. So much so that on February 14th, they launched a large scale live stream shopping event with more than 100 of their Lin Quin Zhuang shopping advisors who had previously just been uh, store clerks essentially. And more than 60,000 people tuned into the live stream with sales from one shopping advisor in two hours ending up equaling that of four retail stores over the same time period. Uh, because of this, Lin Quinshan is now committed to training their in-store shopping advisors, uh, repurposing them and giving them new uh, skills in order to become live streaming influencers in their own right. So the tools are out there for retailers to scale, to scale up digitally very quickly, uh, both by capturing uh, capturing attention by acting as a thought leader, as an authentic presence within their space, and then also providing that uh, that one-to-one -one customer service uh, through, through different digital channels. Another area that has seen a really big spike in usage, uh, both here in the US and in China, um, is, the, is the rise of click and collect, which had already been um, rising in popularity. Um, even before the outbreak, as I mentioned, uh, Click and Collect was forecast to account for almost $88 billion in sales by 2023. And we can certainly uh, expect the coronavirus to accelerate that projection. Um, so some stores that had already implemented this that had uh, were, were actually uh, using their stores as, as distribution centers to service e-commerce demands include Walmart, Macy's, Gap, Target, Nordstrom, Best Buy, um, and they were already seeing the benefits of in-store pickup. But once non-essential retail opens up, up again, these concepts will likely appeal to consumers that are still wary about shopping in crowded places and spending too much time there or perhaps sorting through products that others may have, have touched. Um, Target is one of is a really good example. Uh, they actually believe that physical is their answer to digital, uh, because they have so many stores. They act as distribution points, uh, and they and Target stores themselves fulfill 80% of the retailer's digital sales volume, with 24% of those digital sales uh, being same day services uh, from Click and Collect. In direct response to the coronavirus, uh, Kroger opened a click and collect only grocery store in Cincinnati on March 25th because of the local demand for click and collect services. Um, and in-store shopping is not even a, uh, it's not even an option at this particular location. The store associates are focused solely on fulfilling online grocery pickup orders. And uh, they would be fulfilled the same way that uh, other click and collect uh, it is being fulfilled the same way that normal click and collect orders are being fulfilled uh, by ordering via the Kroger mobile app or on Kroger.com. Uh, this is obviously ideal for senior or high risk shoppers as well. Uh, this is an example that I just had to throw in here uh, because I, I hope it is a trend that continues <laughs> coming out of coronavirus. But um, since we know that dogs are not able to contract the coronavirus, uh, there was a winery in uh, in Maryland that actually implemented uh, <laughs> uh, curbside dog delivery where they have this this dog whose name is Soda Pop uh, who they strap two bottles of wine to the side of their of, of the dog and he would run out and deliver that, those bottles of wine to someone sitting in their car. Getting back to more of a technology based solution. Um, something that I thought was pretty interesting here was uh, Instacart's leave at my door delivery option, which before the spread of the pandemic was only available to certain beta users um, in, uh, in specific cities in the US and Canada. 
but in direct response to the coronavirus, they actually uh, rolled this out across North America so that when you order from Instacart, you, there's a, an opt-in option where you can just have leave at my door delivery uh, during checkout. Um, and provide specific instructions like, you know, leave it inside the screen door or leave it at the on the back porch um, and in gate codes and apartment numbers. And then the delivery person will leave a photo to alert the consumer when their groceries have arrived at their doorstep. So originally it was designed uh, just as a more flexible option for consumers who may not be home at the time of delivery, who might be spending time with their children, who might be sick in bed from non-coronavirus related illness um, and so this is the type of uh, ease of access that we believe is going to uh, continue to, to be used even as we go through the recovery period. As you're starting to notice this trend a lot of these solutions are uh, are aimed at limiting uh, physical contact and uh, human to human interaction and so in the US and China we've actually seen uh, automated robots deployed for contact contactless delivery. This is something that had already existed uh, again in, in the US and in China, in the US specifically on a couple of um, college campuses. This is one of our partners, Starship Technologies, uh, that essentially is like a little cooler robot that drives directly to someone's door. When it arrives, you get a custom pin that only you can use to unlock the top of the, the robot. Once you remove your groceries, it goes back um, and and it goes back to its, its distribution point. Um, and so these last mile delivery services, um, although they've already existed beforehand, we're, we're now seeing um, increased adoption. Uh, we've seen more uh, retailers license this, this technology and, and form partnerships in order to fulfill uh, essential goods delivery uh, to their areas. This is something that we think has the potential to have some staying power as these companies uh, consider keeping these options on board. Uh, they may see that it, it increases in efficiency and potentially reduces labor costs as well. So we can't talk about e-commerce without talking about Amazon, obviously, and they have had to adapt in a big way. Uh, they are only receiving vital supplies at all of their US, UK, and other European warehouses. Um, and it's a move to free up inventory space for medical and household goods that are in high demand because of the coronavirus. Um, they define several categories as essential products where that people can continue shopping, including baby products, health, household items, beauty, personal care, grocery, excuse me, industrial and scientific and pet supplies. And um, I guess kind of as a uh, nod to their roots and also because they know people are looking for some type of escapism, books are also included as an essential item. Um, as those of you who are Amazon Prime members have probably noticed, uh, this has had a massive impact on their two day shipping guarantee. Uh, in some cases, deliveries has, have been slowed to, uh, to seven days or even longer. Um, and this change, this, this, uh, the change in the inventory that they're choosing to stock has had a massive impact on third party sellers that currently depend on Amazon um, and they are having to shift their sales to other marketplaces, uh, whereas before coronavirus, they may not have considered doing so. So a lot of third party retailers are actually moving onto platforms like eBay, and Wish, Walmart, Facebook Marketplace, et cetera. And this is actually having uh, an impact on Amazon's ad revenue because quite simply, it's hard to, for these third party retailers to justify spending money on promotion if they don't even have enough inventory to fill their orders. So we're seeing uh, a, a really big rise in the adoption of different types of technology that are uh, helping getting essential goods to people's doors. Uh, and we'll also see a big shift in, in uh, kind of how Amazon has been considered an essential business and also the types of products that you're able to find on that platform. So I'm gonna just pause here before we go into the next section. Are there any questions? Yes, two questions and a comment. Uh, the first comment, I believe, was referring to uh, people buying more tops for uh, uh, for use at home. Um, and the, the comment was that it's actually called upperware. 
currently, um, which sounds good. Uh, okay, didn't know that. That's fancy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so the first question is, uh, is there a difference in socioeconomic class that impacts whether consumers shop online or in store? Yes, uh, that is a great question, and that is something that is kind of an underlying theme across a lot of the disruption that we've seen because of coronavirus. Um, especially, I mean, my mind immediately goes to education and how a lot of um, a lot of classes have been going online, but there are uh, some socioeconomic classes uh, are there are people who who just simply don't have as reliable internet access. And so uh, that obviously translates to the ability to um, being able to access and order products online. Um, and so it, it will disproportionately affect people who do not have access to those types of, of uh, resources. Yep, one more question. Was the app growth for Walmart uh, in comparison to Amazon, was that comparing Walmart grocery to Amazon Fresh or Walmart overall to Amazon overall? It was comparing Walmart grocery to Amazon overall. So Walmart, the Walmart grocery specific app um, has overtaken the Amazon shopping app as the number one app in the shopping category. Sounds good. Cool. OK, so this next section that we're going to talk about uh, kind of a growing category of um, of consumables that that we're starting to see. Um, obviously, around the world, hundreds of millions of people have been forced to stay at home uh, to prevent the spread of the disease. But individuals are still craving methods of self-expression, uh, regardless of, you know, having, regardless of being forced to connect inside of virtual spaces as opposed to physical ones. Um, and so there's, we're seeing these kind of a new uh, class of assets. Uh, that are on the market that people are willing to spend their hard-earned money for, um, but actually only exist in a digital sense. Um, as it happens, there's one industry that is custom built for people to stay indoors and to socialize over long distance, and that is video games. Um, and this is kind of the first place that we're seeing these digital assets attract uh, substantial demand. And even before the COVID outbreak, uh, some of the most popular on online games were already delivering 1.2 to 1.5 billion hours of playtime across 80 to 120 million monthly active users. Um, and this is before you even count the hundreds of additional hours of YouTube and Twitch viewing that takes place. Um, and within the range of in-app purchases that are available to players, um, it's largely uh, access to cosmetic updates, so it's not necessarily anything that um, enhances your performance in the game. It is solely, again, as I mentioned before, the ability for these people who are now socializing in uh, virtual ecosystems to express their individuality uh, by upgrading the look of their avatar or their character. Um, Close to 70% of Fortnite players have invested real money into the game, although it is a free to play game. Um, and on average, they're spending uh, $85 per user, which is not an insignificant amount of money when you go back and, and remember that, that there are around 80 to 120 million monthly active users. Um, and just to put that in perspective, Fortnite generated $2.4 billion of revenue in 2018. Uh, and again, that is a free game that does not charge people to play. But this is an example of developer created assets that the community is purchasing. There are other games that have launched marketplaces where users can actually develop and sell their own user generated assets to other users. Um, Roblox is an example of that where in September they launched this marketplace that allows developers to not only monetize their games that they are creating within the Roblox platform, but also any assets, plugins, vehicles, 3D models, or any other types of items that they made uh, for that game as well. 
and to give you a sense of, of how successful this has been, last year Roblox paid out $100 million to developers uh, who were creating user-generated content versus more than $500 million uh, to individual users who are creating this content. So in effect, Roblox has created an ecosystem where people can start small businesses that by strictly selling digital goods. And with social distancing measures in place, obviously there has been a massive spike in the number of people that are playing, downloading, and even wa watching video games. Um, and video game industry stocks, although they have been hurt by the recent market crash, are still performing better than the broader indices uh, by as much as 10%. Um, I mentioned briefly that gaming viewership is up as well. Twitch is seeing almost 10% more hours watched versus uh, in February, they saw 10% more hours watched than uh, in 2019. And just as a little anecdotal evidence here, one of our partners uh, that's a, a, a gaming influencer network said that their uh, donations and subscriptions uh, to their influencers that they support have gone up around 17% month over month. Um, so not only are people play, paying to play the games and to make their own characters, uh, you know, more individual and, and expressive within the game that they're playing, they're also spending a decent amount of money for the experience and the access of watching video games as well. And we're seeing some non-endemic brands start to notice uh, even before the coronavirus outbreak. Um, that we're seeing brands like Louis Vuitton understand the potential of these digital assets. Uh, last year, they partnered with Riot Games to design a capsule collection for the game League of Legends, which in addition to a physical collection that you can actually purchase and wear in the real world, which seems like a ridiculous qualifying statement to have to make, um, players can also purchase these Louis Vuitton design skins to enhance their character in game. Um, and to give you a sense of the cost, it's obviously a lot more accessible than what a Louis Vuitton outfit would cost in the real world. Uh, these Louis Vuitton design skins are going for a little bit more than $10 a pop. So it's a way for people who are spending time with their friends in a virtual atmosphere uh, to, to, you know, kind of add a little bit of that luxury and individualism to their look uh, at a much more accessible price point than uh, if they were to, to flaunt that type of outfit, outfit in a bar, for example. And so outside of video games, there's actually, we're seeing some pretty interesting things happening in the uh, social in the space of social influence. Um, there is this trend where influencers are buying statement pieces to be worn and posted one time, um, which is, I mean, not to get into the environmental impact of <laughs> of what that means. It's also not really sustainable in terms of the economic impact to these individual influencers unless they're making quite a bit of money off their social posts. Um, so in response to this, a fashion house called Carlings launched its first digital only collection last November, which is called Neo X. And how it works is after you purchase an outfit, from them, uh, from a 19 piece collection, uh, a group of 3D designers at Carlings will digitally quote unquote fit the look onto a photo of the buyer that they've submitted so that they can post to social media. Um, so all three of these images, uh, you can tell what which uh, statement piece I'm probably referring to in each of them. Um, those are actually digitally rendered onto the user. They do not exist in the in the physical world. Um, and these are going again for a much more economical price point of between nine and 30 pounds uh, per garment. Kind of going into this uh, discussion of, of accessibility and other um, assets that digital assets that people are willing to spend their money on now that we're spending so much time online. Uh, there are a lot of new categories that are opening up for digital spend. So early on in the outbreak, Twitch partnered with SoundCloud to allow artists to reach affiliate status very quickly and monetize live streams of their in-home concerts and studio sessions. So the creative talent and services that 
would usually be distributed via offline channels like a concert, for example, uh, under normal circumstances have suddenly shifted online and adopted new formats where uh, these artists are able to reach audiences who are stuck at their home. And even after the pandemic passes, we do expect that a lot of these artists might uh, try to sustain their online presence as they see that they are actually generating a decent amount of revenue uh, from these from uh, allowing this access to their fan base. Um, kind of an extreme example of this is a virtual nightlife experience called Quarantine, um, which is a uh, basically trying to give that New York City nightlife experience via Zoom. It actually requests that participants wear nightclub attire and even charges them a $10 cover charge in order to join the nightclub and see um, a DJ set from, it looks like this one was from Bruno. Uh, I don't know who that is, but um, they also are charging up to $80 for a private table, which means a private group chat that you can use to listen to the DJ. So. Uh, personally, this sounds terrible to me, but uh, 300 people actually joined the first party that they hosted. So it'll be interesting to see if this is the kind of thing that actually has staying power going forward, or if uh, people are going to be yearning for more uh, physical contact <laughs> as we're able to finally relax our social distancing a little bit. Uh, this is another kind of wacky example here, but I had to include it uh, as something that people are, are spending their money on now. Uh, this is a company called Goat to Meeting, which uh, is run by an animal sanctuary in Silicon Valley called Sweet Farm. It's letting people rent time to get llamas, goats, and other farm animals to tune into their video calls for under $100. So I think for our next lab half hour, we might have to uh, look into investing. I know Adam and I have been discussing that, but uh, they fielded more than 300 requests for animal cameos and virtual field trips for these work happy hours and corporate meetings. And the money that they're raising is going to help uh, the farm recover some of the revenue that it's lost due to the coronavirus lockdown orders. So uh, obviously that's a bit of a silly example, but um, you know, they're Again, we are seeing this new category of goods become sought after in a digital landscape. Uh, now that so much of our work and social lives have moved online, these digital goods and assets are becoming more important than ever. Uh, West Elm was very early to respond. They distributed owned assets through their social channels that people can use to spruce up their Zoom backgrounds for video conferences. Um, so another asset that people are valuing, obviously this is something that they're just giving out for free, but it's a good way to uh, to build that goodwill, goodwill with consumers while they're not going to, uh, to, to visit uh, furniture stores at the moment. So um, in the long run, this accelerated democratization of digital creativity will continue to diversify what is already a dynamic uh, UGC landscape and also further fragment audience attention and reprioritize uh, category specific expertise over generic attention seeking. Um, so smart brands right now should be making an effort to support digital creators with the right tools and brand assets, uh, thus enabling loyal fans to become brand advocates on their own. And I will pause for a moment there before we go into our final section. No questions uh, on GoToMeeting or, or other content from that section. Okay, cool. We will follow up with additional GoToMeeting content as it becomes available. Thank you, Adam. Um, okay, so the last section here is uh, supply chain diversification. Uh, one major effect of the outbreak that until now was not quite as visible to the general population is this supply chain disruption and uh, our overwhelming reliance on China. Um, even before the coronavirus outbreak, there had been a viewpoint that emerged that we were too dependent on China uh, going back a couple of years ago. Uh, different risks that included human rights violations, uh, protecting intellectual property, increasing manufacturing wages in China, and uh, newly imposed U.S. tariffs on imports from China. And although the trade war prompted many companies to explore manufacturing in other countries, um, a lot of industries do have deep roots there, which makes it very challenging to diversify. Um, we have seen, as this chart demonstrates, that uh, there has been a 
decline in imports uh, from China as companies uh, try to diversify. Uh, more than 80% of fashion brands, for example, in a July US uh, Fashion Industry Association report said they plan to reduce sourcing from China. Uh, but even as importers add tier one suppliers in other countries, um, they those suppliers may actually still rely on China for raw materials and other types of inputs. Uh, for example, Vietnam imports 60% of its raw materials for its garment manufacturing from China. So even supply chains that have diversified tier one suppliers are not necessarily immune to the risks uh, in, in China. And in as a direct result of the coronavirus, um, as of late February, 9% of shipping fleets rendered uh, had been rendered inactive worldwide. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles expects that the outbreak will result in a 25% year-over-year reduction in volume um, and a 15% year-over-year decline in overall volume for the first quarter of 2020. Um, and so what this looks like to consumers is empty shelves. Uh, we've actually been a little lucky so far. There's been a slight buffer period uh, because many businesses actually stocked, stockpiled inventory in 2019 as they were trying to get ahead of some of the tariff deadlines stemming from the US-China trade war. Uh, as a result, many companies entered 2020 with elevated inventory levels. Um, so. US and European manufacturers who have been facing high demand actually had enough inventory to meet those cons uh, customer needs in, in Q1. Uh, but second quarter is when we're going to start to feel the pinch. Uh, automotive and retail supply chains could actually see stockouts as soon as May, unfortunately, according to a McKinsey analysis. Another consumer impact that uh, that that consumers see from from this uh, supply chain issue is price gouging for essential goods. As you can see, this is a screenshot just pulled right from Amazon uh, a couple weeks ago where uh, hand sanitizer has been gouged up to $350 for a two pack, uh, which is obviously not uh, in anyone's best interest. Uh, there's also a good deal of uh, fake products being featured on Amazon as well, uh, which is an issue that had already been percolating before the COVID outbreak, but has uh, been exacerbated as so much attention has gone to Amazon in order to uh, try and get their hands on, try and get hands on on essential products. So that's something that's worth keeping an eye on, especially uh, when you think about uh, sectors like the health industry, which have been hit in incredibly hard. Um, like many industries, uh, medical device and pharmaceutical supply chains rely on China for imports of finished goods, components, and input materials. Um, and not only are the people that need these materials and products the most uh, not able to get them, but there's much more increased demand for, um, for consumer-facing products uh, that are kind of taken away from the supply that, that these people need, which is, which is very unfortunate. Uh, medical equipment imports from the U.S to the US from China totaled $5.2 billion in 2019, and 80% of active pharmaceutical ingredients are produced abroad, uh, primarily in China and India. And so this is actually causing brands to step up, uh, retailers to respond. Uh, the uh, MLB and, and Fanatics are two examples uh, where they've shifted production of, of their US-based manufacturing plants away from authentic jerseys to uh, smocks and protective face gear. Uh, New Balance has also shifted. They're making 100,000 masks a week. And just to re reiterate the point that I brought up um, at the beginning is consumers are paying attention to this type of response. 66% of consumers stated that a brand's response will impact their purchase intent uh, going forward. Uh, so again, at a time where um, you know, brand loyalty is kind of thrown up in the air because of empty, uh, empty shelves. One way that brands can earn that uh, that cachet with consumers is by uh, demonstrating that they're they're in it with us and that they're they're uh, using their resources to help. So just to to close here, uh, there are a number of trends that we do uh, expect going forward to 
uh, to continue. Uh, there's going to be consumer adoption of many technology-enabled uh, commerce solutions. Uh, those those that adoption is likely to deepen and broaden permanently, uh, not returning back to uh, to traditional brick and mortar uh, avenues. Um, even in segments like grocery, which have to date resisted large scale migration from stores to online. Um, contactless payment adoption is, is, is already increasing and is sure to continue as people are at first forced into using it due to their own concerns about uh, reducing human contact, but then also realizing that it's actually a very efficient way to check out. Um, expanded e-commerce and click and collect kind of touched on as well. Brand loyalty reset. Uh, now is a really important time for, for brands to show that they're they're helping and they're concerned because uh, there's going to be an opportunity to gain some of that mind share uh, with our consumers. Um, it's really important if, uh, if your brands don't already have the digital touch points in place to figure out how we can uh, provide that one-to-one -one service to our consumers at a large scale. Uh, via digital uh, elements, there are a whole new. There's a whole new asset of digital goods. Uh, there's a whole new, I should say, uh, class of digital assets that are that are in great demand right now. That uh, people may decide that they they are willing to continue to spend on. Um, and again, uh, you know, I think the, the 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 key word here, the key takeaway, is diversification in terms of uh, supply chain and in terms of uh, consumer interactions. You know, we we're now seeing how fragile a lot of these uh, these these supply chains and these interactions are, and so it's important to have a system in place or processes in place where if one leg fails, the other one can can hold up the business. Um, so with that, I'm going to pause again and see if we have any closing questions. Uh, just two comments from Joshua Logak. Uh, so the first one, the bigger issue on China is even if the country is back online, there's no retail demand in the US. From my intel, there's a backlog of inventory supply not yet cleared customs because retail warehouses are not shipping to idle stores. Um, and the second comment is uh, there's a challenge with fake products filling online stores like Amazon right now as, as known brands can't meet supply. Yeah. Great points, Joshua. I, I, I think that to your first point, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully some of those products will be able to clear customs, uh, you know, before the uh, the retailers on the U.S. side have stockouts in May. Um, and I, I do think that the fake product uh, problem is totally exacerbated right now, and uh, is, is something that we're going to have to take a real honest look at. And and it's something that brands are going to have to. You know, maybe as part of their uh, third party sales uh, protocol is not only getting the right stuff up for sale, but also making sure that the wrong stuff gets taken down as well. Great. Well, thank you all for um, spending the time here. Really appreciate it. Uh, this presentation, this, a video of this presentation is going to be available uh, for uh, wider broadcast as well. Um, please, if you have any further questions or if you haven't been in touch with me already about um, setting up time with, uh, with clients, uh, setting up sessions with clients, this is a really good way to kind of provide thought leadership and, and get them outside of their regular day-to-day -day thinking. We're obviously happy to work with you guys to uh, customize the content and make sure that it's as impactful and useful to your clients as possible. Uh, I'm gonna put a little plug out there. On Friday, our partnerships team has been doing office hours with, uh, with various partners on Twitch from two to three o'clock. This week we have Adder who is a uh, an influencer network for gaming. So uh, if you have any questions about, you know, what's going on uh, in the gaming space and what are good ways to get involved, I think that's a good, that'll be a good uh, overview discussion. And then you have an opportunity to submit questions in the chat. Um, if you guys have any further questions, feel free to reach out to Adam, myself, or anyone at the lab. Uh, everyone stay safe and again, really appreciate the time.